So let's start off with a bit of background. We'll just go over who are we and a little bit more in depth. I'm a senior scientist with Herrera. Some of you may know me from uh, Washington State University. I was faculty with them for 14 years, and uh, I'm the author of the LID Technical Guidance Manual, Rain Garden Handbook, and uh, led the LID research program and was the LID specialist for WSU for, for many years. I'm Chris Webb. I'm really happy to be here in my hometown. I moved to Bellingham in 1995 with the intent of practicing engineering in a more environmentally friendly way, and that led me to uh, get involved in some of the early installations of low impact development, and that's been uh, the focus of my practice for the last uh, almost 20 years, and I'm really happy to be here today. We're going to start off with getting some water quality treatment, and then the, really the heart of the uh, presentation, bioretention siting and design, construction, inspection, verification. So let's get into the detail of design and how to keep these things running long term. So what are the objectives today? Kind of peg the intermediate level introductory entry level bioretention system design. Site assessment's critical, so we'll talk quite a bit about that. Locating uh, bioretention in residential and commercial areas, both those settings. And then practical skills. In fact, I'm sure there's a lot of experience out there in the audience, so we'd like, love to hear from you on your practical experience. Uh, we're going to, between the two of us, we have a lot of practical experience putting this stuff in the ground. And so that will certainly be part of this discussion and a very important part of that. So just by way of background, as you probably all know, we have new permit requirements coming online soon. Basically, they break down into three areas, building site and subdivision, a regulation and code, municipal code, and then watershed scale. So this is something, uh, that third bullet is something relatively new. There's a few jurisdictions that are thinking about and uh, uh, applying um, the low impact development approach at a watershed scale. And what does that mean? Woodenville, Redmond, Bothell, they are special. They are kind of taking on this sort of unique and new piece to the permit and thinking on, about this stuff at a watershed regional scale. Again, are probably all aware, we've got phase one permittees involved in phase two. A lot, of, of course, a lot more phase two than phase one. And a lot of um, secondary permittees involved in this. And as you know, generally this stuff, right, phases in with phase one first, and then phase two follows up. And that's certainly what's happening with the new permit requirements. Generally, the schedule, site and subdivision, stormwater code, and development codes, revising development codes, about, you know, on the same schedule. I think, you know, we see the train now. It'll be fully pulled into the station next year. And so there's discussion at the state level of how, to, how do we move this all along together. And that may revise some scheduling to some degree. And I don't know the current status of that. We have some uh, minimum requirements. Many of you, again, are probably familiar with this. Uh, there's some, been some changes with the new permit, but a lot of similarities. In one through nine, you're into you know, full stormwater management implementation. So this is when you have a development project, more than 5,000 square feet of new and replaced hard surface, three quarter acre vegetation, lawn landscape, or 2.5 acres uh, native vegetation pa to pasture-like condition. So that triggers one through nine, and that means you're doing, you're, you're you know, fully implementing stormwater management uh, controls, both flow control to some degree and water quality treatment to some degree. Minimum requirement one through five, you know, incorporates the, the new LID standard. This is where you would be using, for example, either it could be at a subdivision scale, be a little unusual, certainly at the single family lot, uh, using rain garden instead of bioretention. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, then now you're talking about between 2,000 square feet of new and replaced hard surface and 5,000, uh, 7,000 square feet of land disturbance. Then you've triggered one through five, less uh, onerous, less uh, um, rigor, uh, rigor as far as flow control and water quality treatment. And uh, uh, nevertheless, th so this is where some of, the, some of the new guidelines lie in the permit, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through. And then, you know, there's essentially always uh, sediment erosion control. The, these are the basics as far as what drives implementation, uh, what we'd be putting on the ground. Something I want to mention here is that in some settings, you certainly have these settings in Whatcom County as well as many other counties, uh, essentially all other counties other than eastern Washington, all western Washington counties. Um, the new uh, flow control guidelines are, uh, in some settings, greenfield development, sensitive streams, sensitive receiving streams. 
you're in a situation where you have very rigorous flow, flow control. Unless there's some exemption involved. Uh, you got a big river here. You know, you're discharging your nook, nook sack. So you might have requirements, but you wouldn't have the same kind of flow control requirements. But discharging to a sensitive stream, uh, you're essentially controlling all water on site. Uh, speaking in rough, <laughs> round numbers here. But um, in many cases, it's very, very, very difficult, if not practically feasible, to meet those requirements solely with our standard uh, f uh, flow control uh, management devices. Um, the ponds, for example, get so large that you start to cut into your uh, developable land and it can become difficult to meet either densities or uh, you lose enough building uh, lots where it becomes financially infeasible, those sorts of things. Uh, and that's where um, uh, low impact development really comes in and in if implementing low impact development, perhaps along with conventional controls, maybe at the end, they might be much, well they would be, much smaller. Uh, that in many, setting, in many settings uh, might be the only practical way to really meet those very rigorous, the very rigorous flow control standards. So um, just a you know, side note, and uh, that's something we'll be, of course, I mean, people will be learning along the way. But that's certainly been the case, uh, uh, been demonstrated on, on several, several development projects where the developer was only able to meet a, a very restrictive flow control guideline using both of those, um, both techniques or, or solely the low impact development uh, approach. Just a different look at the minimum requirements. Most of this discussion focuses on two, construction, stormwater, pollution prevention, very, a little bit there. A lot on number five, on-site stormwater management. On-site in the, uh, you know, in, in, in our permit speak is really low impact development uh, approach, right? On-site stuff. That's what, that's the, uh, the terms that the, the state has adopted. Uh, and then there's, uh, of course, all this other, sh other stuff. Uh, uh, number nine, I'll also point out number nine, operation and maintenance. Um, there's a new uh, element 13 um, now requiring, requiring um, uh, maintenance agreements, maintenance plan and agreements for low impact development specifically. Okay, we've had that in the past for conventional. That's now gonna be regulation for low impact development projects as well. Have to have a management plan and agreement. Um, and that's element 13, spelled out in detail, chapter three, section 3.3.3, .3 .3, volume two. You got that? Yes, buried in the manual. <laughs>